So for the second part of exam four review, we're going to go over reproductive and pulmonary systems. Part one completed renal and GI, so we're going to continue on and move forward with, let's go ahead and start with reproduction. Uh, wait a minute, there we go. Okay, so the reproductive system, the first thing we're going to talk about is something called primary dysmenorrhea. So primary dysmenorrhea is really attributed to excessive endometrial prostaglandin production. Women have very, very painful periods, and those that do usually produce almost 10 times more prostaglandin than those that don't. So prostaglandin is a very, very potent vasoconstrictor and therefore elevated levels of prostaglandin can cause that uterine hypercontractility. It decreases that blood flow to the uterus. Now, with these patients, um, the reason ibuprofen works so well with these patients is because we know that ibuprofen can decrease the synthesis of prostaglandin. So, Secondary dysmenorrhea, on the other hand, is caused by something. So when I say something, I mean endometriosis. So endometriosis, we're going to talk about that all by itself here in just a couple minutes. But also things like pelvic inflammatory disease, obstructive uterine or vaginal abnormalities, uterine fibroids, and we're going to talk about these leomas in just a minute. So once you're a provider, you want to distinguish between primary, which is pretty well consistent every month, versus maybe a sudden onset. They've just started having these really, really painful um, menstruation, and so that's going to move you into what's going on with that patient. So next we're going to talk about something called le leomyomas. Leomyomas, or like I just mentioned, they're well known as uterine fibroids. So uterine fibroids. So they're commonly called myomas, or like I said, those fibroids. They're benign, smooth muscle tumors, and you can see by this picture, um, ooh, you can see how those can be very painful. But it can cause something called abnormal uterine bleeding, AUB. So AUB can be caused by several things. There's an acronym out there called PALM, P-A-L-M, and the P stands for polyps, uterine polyps. The A stands for adenomyosis. Of course, the L stands for the leo leomyomas, and then the M is for malignancy. So when patients come in with this abnormal uterine bleeding, you have to determine, either through process of elimination and their history as to what potentially is causing this. Most of the time with those leomas, they can bleed extremely heavily and sometimes it is a cause for, and a good cause for, a hysterectomy. Next is the um, polycystic ovarian syndrome. Uh, so we abbreviate this with PCOS. You can see there in that corner the polycystic ovaries. Not all patients have polycystic ovaries, and yet they can still have that hyperandrogenic state, so that increased secretion of andro androgens. Um, so that's not always a way to rule this disease out. However, what is one of the clinical manifestations is that glucose intolerance and insulin resistance. Also, hyperinsulinemia often run parallel and will aggravate that increased androgen state. So one thing about these patients, they do a lot of the time have problems with their weight, and yet obesity will add to and worsen that insulin resistance. So those excessive androgens affect that follicular growth. The problem with these patients, and probably the saddest outcome, is the um, huge potential for infertility. Next, benign ovarian cysts. So benign ovarian cysts, um, they're really quite common and are the fourth leading cause diagnosis of gynecological hospital admissions. That's because they can be extremely painful. As you can see down in the corner, that's a huge 
ovarian cyst and you could see where hmm, that could cause pain. Most of the time patients aren't even aware that they have them, but one reason I want to bring this to your attention is sometimes they mimic an appendicitis, particularly if it's on that right side, um, that right ovary. And so that's where CAT scans have been really the gold standards in determining whether or not a patient has an appendicitis. A lot of um, past surgeries, uh, they were looking for an inflamed appendix, and sure enough, there it was, a benign ovarian cyst. Um, and so once again, you have to make sure that you do determine and differentiate between these two phenomenon. So what happens is those benign cysts of the ovary are produced when a follicle or a number of follicles are stimulated but no dominant follicle develops and therefore it doesn't complete that maturation process. Next we're going to talk about something that is definitely in the news and uh, a lot of commercials are pushing for the HPV vaccine for those adolescent years. It is controversial and what we do as the provider, you just have to give the best education to the patients to make a good decision. Whether we believe in it or not, um, it's definitely their call. So previously, efforts at early screening resulted in many young women receiving treatments on their cervix. And actually, precancerous lesions from HPV as well as cancer really doesn't push till after that age of 21. So now the recommended guidelines are not to do anything and allow the patient that chance to clear the virus on their own. And most of the time it is cleared with absolutely no sequela. However, there are high risk patients. Those that smoke, those seem to convert and cause that precancer or that cancerous state. So once again, good education, teaching those high risk um, factors that can hopefully prevent that from converting to the cancerous state. You see down there, in the corner, you'll see how the uh, progression and potential for precancer and cancer related to HPV. And you do see that after the age of 30 is when it really becomes prevalent. So let's talk about sexually transmitted infections. So when we talk about trans sexually transmitted infection, we, the uh, term venereal disease is outdated. We don't use that anymore. STI is really the most current and most accurate uh, description of these infections. And so there's uh, two that we're gonna focus on. Of course, there's others. But many infected, infected individuals do not seek treatment. And that's why the CDC has declared STIs as an epidemic. Uh, they don't wanna go to the healthcare provider. Maybe they can't afford it, whatever. But urogenital infections caused by chlamydia really closely parallel those caused by gonorrhea. So a lot of times if a patient does come in with um, symptoms, uh, you're gonna go ahead and check for both these because they like to hang out together. So um, something else that has certainly been in the news and uh, is now actually in the pathophysiology textbooks is something called the Zika virus. So the Zika virus has now been declared by the CDC as a text sexually transmitted infection. Um, the way we first discovered it, the way the healthcare community first discovered it was because it was transmitted through the bites of infected mosquitoes. Then later on it was found out that it actually can also be transmitted through sexual transmission, but they're not sure exactly how that's done. And so the CDC is still investigating exactly how to advise for safer sex precautions. So we know that the infected mosquito, it also has what we call vertical transmission, which easily occurs in the infected woman and can also be transmitted to the fetus. And that's where we hear about those horrible, severe fetal infections that are associated with those uh, central nervous system abnormalities. So we're gonna talk about the Seelies. So the Seelies, um, it's kind of like the name of a family. 
but these are kind of the three big ones that you're probably going to see in your practice. Um, cystocele, so if you break that down, cysto is the bladder. So you know it's the bladder, portion of the posterior bladder to be more specific, <laughs> goes into that vaginal canal. This is what's usually associated with trauma of childbirth. So later on, uh, these are the women that come in, I sneeze, I cough, and I leak urine. Um, and so a good, once again, physical, trying to figure out. And of course, there's treatments for this, sometimes surgical. Rectocele, on the other hand, is tear it down, recto, rectum. So once again, it can be done, it can be happen during childbirth, but sometimes it's related to long chronic constipation, and this causes the bulging of the rectum into that posterior vaginal wall. Let's go to the male side of the reproductive system, uh, spermatoceles. So spermatoceles, or sometimes called epidemal cysts, are benign cystic collections of fluid. So that fluid is, used, is in the epididymis. The fluid with a spermatocele is usually more, is more milky because there's sperm within that fluid. A hydrocele, on the other hand, has clear fluid. So sometimes that can help determine what kind of cele that that actually is. Next, prostatitis. So prostatitis syndromes, there's four different kinds, but the take home message here is acute bacterial prostatitis. This is usually caused of an ascending infection from the urinary tract. So the clinical manifestations of this is that they have a sudden onset of malaise. Malaise is that feeling of being tired, you know, when people say, I just don't feel well. Low back pain, perineal pain, very, very high fever of 104 is possible. Also chills, of course, that makes sense. Dysuria and um, inability to enter the bladder. Also, they'll experience painful ejaculation. Sometimes that's what ends up bringing them into the healthcare provider. So as promised, let's talk a little bit about endometriosis. So endometriosis certainly is the presence of functioning endometrial tissue, but it's outside the uterus. And you can see by this beautiful picture, those black areas, that's where this endometrial tissue can plant itself outside the uterus. Well, the interesting thing about endometriosis is that, see where those spots are, they are susceptible, influenced by the hormones that also fluctuate with that menstrual cycle. So these patients have, this is what we call secondary dysmenorrhea, but these are those patients that come in with horrific menstrual cramps. Also some of those signs and symptoms is they can have painful intercourse and this actually can impact their activities of daily living. It can impact their work. In other words, they literally have to miss days of work because the pain is so excruciating. Um, so very, very, uh, I would say almost devastating disease. Um, and it can also possibly lead to infertility. The next we're gonna talk about is the pulmonary system. So let's move on to tuberculosis. So really tuberculosis has decreased somewhat in the United States, but not in the world. Um, the other thing that is continually on the increase is multi-drug resistance tuberculosis. Um, and so we're starting to see more and more of that over the last five years. And that's because of that non-compliance, non-adherence to that medication regimen, which there's four of them, which of course you'll learn that in pharmacology. But it's very highly contagious. It's transmitted from person to person in airborne droplets. So how do we determine? So we screen, that's very important. We screen for TB. Um, Pretty well, the PPD is still in mainstream, mainstream screening procedures, but of course we now have the T-spot, which is a blood, um, which is a 
a blood test. And that is being really researched heavily for its effectiveness, and the results have been very positive. It's the CDC that is running that research. So we're starting to see that the T-spot is also an acceptable way of screening because it rules out um, those patients that have the vaccination by the BCG. A lot of foreign countries, such as England, has that vaccination, and so they automatically have a positive PPD. So those are the patients that um, people that have to get that yearly chest, uh, chest x-ray to rule out TB. So this is very, very promising, and some hospitals have already adopted the T-spot. So screening for TB with the PPD, if a positive TB test indicates the near the need for yearly chest radiographs, I'd already stated that. But this skin test did not differentiate between past, latent, or active forms of the disease. Definitive diagnosis is still that acid fast that is positive. The problem with that is that it can take up to six weeks to grow the organism that causes TB. And so a lot of times screening with the PPD or the T-spot, it comes back negative. Prophylactically, they may begin on those um, prophylactic anti-TB medications. So the aging normal, normal aging of the pulmonary system. So once again, it's gonna really be influenced by environmental. Does someone live in a nice rural area, nice clean air, or do they live in an urban situation? Sociocultural factors, how well have they taken care of themselves? Um, nutritional status, respiratory diseases, genetics, gender, and some of the other things they have done. Are, were they smokers all their life? Things like that. But the normal alterations are still going to be, to some degree, that loss of elastic recoil, that stiffening of the chest wall. There's going to be some changes in gas exchange and increases in flow resistance. So what we want to do is encourage our patients to maintain a good, healthy weight, eat well, and exercise. Keep up that pulmonary system. So we're going to briefly go into the two major types, categories is what I call them, of lung disorders. So the first is what we call restrictive. So restrictive lung disorders are characterized by decreased compliance of lung tissue. Very simple, but it makes sense. So when we think about this, this means that it takes more effort to expand the lungs during inspiration. So that increases that work of breathing. So a lot of times they have an increased respiratory rate, decreased tidal volume, and they have such things as aspiration. So they have a history of an aspiration. A lot of times this happens in the hospital. That's why we keep our patients at that 30, head of bed 30 degree angle. Another common disorder related to restrictive lung disorders is atelectasis. We're real familiar with that postoperatively. That's why we make sure they cough and deep breathe and they do their inspirometry. So let's go to the other one, something called obstructive pulmonary disease. So obstructive pulmonary disease, we have COPD, which we're gonna talk about in a minute, and that's divided into chronic bronchitis and emphysema, and of course, asthma, which is what we're gonna talk about here in just a minute. So overall, obstructive pulmonary disease is an airway obstruction that is worse with expiration. So these disorders are characterized by infiltration of the lung by inflammatory cells, um, of course dyspnea, and a unifying sign is wheezing. So individuals, once again, they do have that increased work of breathing. Um, and they have a decreased forced expiratory volume, and we call that FEV1, so that is decreased in that one second. We call that measurements of spirometry. You might be more, um, uh, the more common term probably in your clinic or at your acute care facility is pulmonary function test, and that's measuring with spirometry to determine how well are those lungs working. So let's go ahead and start with 
asthma. So an acute asthmatic response, one thing we try and help our patients with is trying to find that trigger. Is it an allergic reaction? Is it some type of food? Uh, is it GERD? We talked about that in part one, how GERD can trigger an asthmatic response. And so whatever that trigger is, we try and diminish contact with it, or if possible, total avoidance. So it's an inflammatory mediators are triggered and they produce that asthma and those mediators are such things as histamine, prostaglandins, and leukotrienes. So in the early response, what we know is the antigen exposure to the bronchial mucosa activates those mediators. It causes vasodilation, increased capillary permeability, and mucosa edema. Those smooth bronchial muscles begin to contract. We call that a bronchial spasm. And then, of course, the mucus becomes tenacious, which just means thick. And what happens is obstruction in the airway. So hopefully those rescue inhalers, that medication that you prescribe, is going to curtail this and the patient comes out of it. However, if they move into the next phase, we call it the late asthmatic response. These are patients that you will probably see in your acute care facilities or they may show up your, at your clinic. So now that rescue inhaler may not be working, whatever, but hypoxemia further increases that feeling of hyperventilation. So that work of breathing increases. So causing PaCO2 to decrease at first and that first is that respiratory alkalosis. However, as obstruction in, increases and um, blocks that expiratory airflow, it puts that respiratory muscles at a mechanical disadvantage. In other words, they're starting to poop out, right? I guess that's not a very well medical terminology to use, but that's kind of what happens. They start literally fatiguing those respiratory muscles. And so now there's a problem with ventilation, right? So they're not able to take that deep breath. They're starting to tire out. And of course, PaCO2 now increases and they move into what's called that respiratory acidosis. So let's move into COPD. So as mentioned, there's two of them. So let's start out with chronic bronchitis. So chronic bronchitis is um, usually defined is hypersecretion of mucus and chronic productive cough that continues for at least three months of the year, usually the winter months, and this happens for two consecutive years. So continual bronchial inflammation causes the bronchial edema and increases the size and number of the mucus glands and goblet cells in the airway epithelium. The number one cause of chronic bronchitis is, of course, smoking. So smoking, what smoking does is you're going to see that picture there, see the pretty pink um, like cells in there, and you can see that pretty yellow brush. That's the cilia. So what happens with the cilia is that's what is continually, it's like an escalator. It grabs on to debris, viruses, whatever we breathe in, and it brings it up into the back of our throat. We cough, whatever, and we get rid of it. With smokers, though, that cilia is continually being worn down. So now these patients don't have that escalator to remove some of that bacteria, viruses, and debris. Now, also what happens is that metaplasia we talked about way back in exam one, and so there's changes going on in the cells. Also, there's changes going on in the goblet cells. The goblet cells is a wonderful thing. It's kind of, it helps secrete that mucus. It kind of sticks to that debris, the bacteria. It jumps on the escalator and up it comes and we cough it out, yay. But with these patients, those goblet cells, they're huge and they keep producing mucus. And the mucus isn't very good, it's really thick it's tenacious, and so what ends up happening with these patients is now they have that mucus, it's thick, they don't have that ciliary action, and they're not very good at being able to cough it out. So those are the two big things, and it continued to perpetuate itself 
hopefully they quit smoking and at least it's not reversible, but at least they can deter any further damage. So the lungs defense mechanisms are very compromised as I just described. Probably a little too much description, but I want you to get a good idea of what you're up against with these patients. And so we really push for those yearly vaccinations such as the flu shot. We really push for them to get that um, pneumonia vaccine and help their immune defend, their immune system defend against these pneumonia because they're very susceptible to it and of course the flu. The other thing that we know about these patients is that they're usually in a uh, consistent state of hypercapnia. What that means is increase in PaCO2. That's where they live. We used to call it 50-50 gases, and uh, those are a little bit extreme that I have here on the PowerPoint. Um, that looks more like an exacerbation of COPD, but you have to remember normally they, they have an increase in that PaCO2, and that's what drives their breathing. Um, the other thing I just want you to be aware of is a picture of this person over here. Most of the time with chronic bronchitis, their phenotype, how they appear, is they're usually a little bit more on that bluish side. More times they have, um, they're a little bit more on the obese side. Um, the old terminology, which I don't think they use as much anymore, but it really helped me during my exam time, uh, is um, um, blue bloaters. Um, that's probably not appropriate, but if you're taking the exam and you have that picture in your mind, it really helps you with those clinical manifestations. The next is emphysema. Something that you have to realize is smokers usually probably um, have a, um, one major phenotype. They're probably chronic, uh, chronic bronchitis, but they may have a little bit of underlying emphysema and vice versa. It's usually not in a pure form with our smokers, but there are some that definitely are more uh, phenotypically uh, emphysemic. And those patients we usually call the pink puffers. Uh, most of the time these patients are more uh, thin. Uh, their arms are a little bit thinner, uh, muscle wasting. They don't eat very well. And that's a result of that destruction. Well, for one thing, they can't breathe, so it's hard to eat. But destruction of the alveoli through the breakdown of elastin within the septum. So you can see a real pretty normal alveoli up here in the corner and here's the damaged one over here. You can see where the walls of the alveoli are broken down and that what causes expiration to become very, very difficult. They lose that elastic recoil that reduces the volume of air that can be expired passively and therefore air trapping occurs. That air trapping over time causes that hyper expansion of the chest and they have what we refer to as a barrel chest. That puts those muscles of respiration again at a mechanical disadvantage. So next is this beautiful table I have I love this table. It really compares chronic bronchitis and emphysema. And productive cough, cough, of course, because of that thick, nasty mucus, that's really a classic sign of chronic bronchitis. With dyspnea in chronic bronchitis, it's a little bit later in the course of the disease versus emphysema, it's very, very common. So chronic bronchitis, usually there's a history of smoking. It's common in both, but I wanna appoint you to emphysema for just a minute. The alpha antitrypsin deficiency, this is genetic disease that is uh, characterized of the clinical manifestations of emphysema who are non-smokers and it develops before the age of 40. So if you have someone that comes into your clinic, whatever, and they're showing the signs and symptoms of emphysema, sometimes they smoke but still it's at that early age. You of course want to do that genetic testing. The barrel chest, and more classic for the emphysema. And of course, cyanosis, I already talked about that. What I want to get to is, of course, the core pulmonal. So core pulmonal, you've learned about this um, in exam three when we talked about right-sided heart failure. And one of the major causes of right-sided right heart failure is, of course, 
uh, COPD. And so remember those signs and symptoms of right-sided heart failure. You're going to see these with our COPD patients as well. So you're going to see that proxismal nocturnal dyspnea. That's where they wake up and all of a sudden they're short of breath. Also orthopnea. What that means is this is the patient that comes in and tell you that they have to sleep in a recliner or they have to have several pillows to elevate their head of the head of the bed in order to breathe while they're sleeping. And of course some of those other ones you're very familiar with with that right-sided failure. So let's talk about pneumoconiosis. Pneumoconiosis is a type of lung disease that we usually associate with um, different types of occupations. Some of those different occupations is such as um, silico silicosis. Silicosis, that's in manufacturing, asbestos, once again, that's in, um, that's in manufacturing yards, navy yards, and of course, coal. So we call that black lung. These are the most common causes. It is not reversible. What we want to do is hopefully um, prevent further exposure and sometimes it turns into more palliative care and just managing the signs and symptoms. But you can see by this picture, you can see that pretty healthy lung. The next picture is a healthy teacher of a 90-year-old school teacher. Now look at the progressive massive fibrosis from this 40-year-old minor. We do have something called OSHA. OSHA tries to protect the worker in the workplaces having um, masks to prevent that inhalation of asbestos or coal. And uh, we actually have nurses in the occupational health setting to help uh, not only advocate but make sure that these protective interventions are in place. So next is lung cancer. So lung cancer um, is <laughs> divided into a couple different kinds. So non-small small cell lung cancer, usually a non-productive cough <clears throat> or uh, hemoptysis, that's just bloody sputum, is very common. Chest pain is a rather late symptom and it's more associated with the size of the tumor. These tumors can remain fairly well localized and they really tend not to metastasize. So when you look down here at the bottom you see small cell, non-small cell um, tumor. You'll see stage one, two, three, and four. Um, but let's go to small cell lung carcinoma. This is the most common type of neuroendocrine lung tumor. So what is a neuroendocrine lung tumor? These tumors go rogue and they're fascinating because they can produce different kinds of hormones. We actually talked about this when we talked about sudden inappropriate secretion of ADH. Um, and so they can produce ADH, uh, they can produce um, other kind of hormones, I'm trying to think of a different one, aldosterone, just bizarre. Um, but the cell type has the strongest correlation with tobacco smoking. Because these tumors are very, very rapid growth and they tend to metastasize early, you're going to see that down there once again. Look at the small cell. When we stage these, there's only two staging, limited or extensive. Usually prognosis is not very good with this type of lung cancer because no signs and symptoms appear until rather late. Next, uh, let me move forward here. So next is pneumonia. So pneumonia is, um, once again, one of the major causes is aspiration in the acute care setting. And once again, go back to that idea that we want to keep our patients head of bed elevated at that 30 degrees. Um, and that is the most common route in which that, it, in which bacteria and whatever goes down into that lower respiratory tract causing that infection. So another route of infection is through just the inhalation of microorganisms that have been released into the air. And so when an infected individual, they cough, they sneeze, they talk, that's why we want to teach our children and even adults to please cover their mouth, uh, sneeze into a tissue, so on and so forth. <clears throat> 
The other clinical manifestations are cough, dyspnea, fever, chills, malaise, and of course pleuritic chest pain. So physical examination is going to reveal signs of pulmonary consolidation. So you can do a chest x-ray of course and it will show that consolidation. Listening uh, with a stethoscope, inspiratory crackles um, are definitely one of the main clinical manifestations. Increased tactile fremitus, agophony, and of course um, whispered pectoral lower Q. That is some of those wonderful physical examinations when they come in before you send them into a chest x-ray. Individuals may also demonstrate signs and symptoms of underlying systemic disease or of course they can go into sepsis, particularly our elderly population. So we're going to move into pulmonary emboli. This is um, associated with alveolar dead space something blocks it so that space is unable to do the normal gas exchanges that the pulmonary system is in charge of. That's the way I think of an emboli. So the hypoxia is due to the absence of blood flow to that lung, se lung segment and it causes that ventilation perfusion mismatch. So there's increased dead space with decreased production of surfactant. Now, the pulmonary emboli is the end result of a, maybe a deep vein thrombosis or a blood clot that has developed and broke loose somewhere else in the body. So these are some of the diagnostics. Chest x-ray findings, those are really nonspecific um, and often can be normal for even the first 24 hours. But a blood test called serum D-dimer can help it at least be indicative of a pulmonary emboli. And this measures a product of thrombus degradation because the body with that pulmonary emboli, it will already begin trying to dissolve it. So you'll see those byproducts and those byproducts will increase that level of a D-dimer. So if normal, if the D-dimer is normal, it makes the presence of a PE highly unlikely. But if it's increased, that gives you that ammunition justification to go to that next level, which is a spiral CT. And next is ARDS. So we're almost there. Um, so ARDS, acute respiratory um, distress syndrome. So disorders that result in ARDS, we've probably named several as we move through this um, semester. Uh, we just finished in part one talking about acute pancreatitis. Um, that's a huge concern with those patients. Um, other causes of ARDS, even pneumonia, uh, sepsis can trigger ARDS. So disorders that result in ARDS cause acute injury to the alveolar or capillary membrane, producing massive pulmonary inflammation, increased capillary permeability, severe pulmonary edema. So in this case, there's a, a pulmonary edema and that results in that filling with fluid, there's shunting, there's mismatch, and of course that hypoxemia. So one thing about that pulmonary edema is that it impairs that diffusion through the alveolar capillary membrane versus when we talked about a pulmonary emboli that we associate with dead space. There's an obstruction. So just kind of make sure you understand the difference between those two pathophysiologic processes. So let's look at this. I took this from your textbook because I think it's beautiful. Um, dyspnea and hypoxemia. But here's the difference when, when you're suspecting that patient is going into ARDS other than whatever the disease that they're suffering from and they have an increased risk. But in this case, these patients become dysmic, hypoxic, you keep increasing the oxygen and it is unresponsive to that increase of that supplemental oxygen. Look out. So they become tachypenic, increase in respiration, uh, that work of breathing increases, and then it begins to 
that hyperventilation, you see that respiratory alkalosis, and the patient's condition continues to deteriorate. You'll see that that decreased tissue perfusion, metabolic acidosis, because remember, the body's going to start shutting down and shunting to the core, and so that's going to decrease the perfusion to the periphery, and so lactic acid's going to start being produced. That meta metabolic acidosis now becomes increased. Now, that's a toxic environment, so you're going to start seeing that organ dysfunction. Continued increased work of breathing, decreased tidal volume, and now the patient's beginning to wear out, and probably mechanical ventilation um, is now the treatment of choice at this point. Hypercapnia, respiratory acidosis. Pretty soon, if it's not reversible, treatment's not working, decreased cardiac output, hypotension, and finally, death. So at this point, this is the end of part two. Once again, we will have our live chat here in the next week, and we can certainly discuss any questions you have. Thank you.